pressure testing. Now, the, our objective here is not just to blow through the test. We're going to talk about this. Now, a lot of times, and it's like that thing says up there, your pressure test is going to seem like something that people don't want to fool with. You know, you got to jack the truck up. you got to find the proper pressure test port. you got to put the gauge on it. And I'll tell you something, though. Before your final exam, I'm probably going to have you do a pressure test. That Oldsmobile we got back there. Rocket. Yeah, but you'll do it on a different car. But uh, and with a problem, hopefully, you know. So anyway, this thing right here, uh, this this Oldsmobile that we have was bought back because of a transmission problem. And I may have y'all to go find out what that why why it was bought back. Well, I found out. I mean, if I found out, y'all <coughs> yes, find out. Right? We'll see. One way or another, uh, most of the, most of the people, most of the mechanics that are doing transmission work don't. I say most of them. A lot of them don't. I've got guys out there. That working on transmissions, and the first thing they do whenever they got one that they feel like there's something wrong on the inside, well, they pop a pressure gauge on it. I don't know what those pressures look like. And what we've said before is one of the wisest things you can do as a mechanic, if you're going to be fooling with transmissions, is put a pressure gauge, get you a pressure gauge, just get you one, buy you one, go to the parts house, get one, pick it up, and hang the pressure gauge on there so you can watch the transmission line pressure. And, uh, you know, there's throttle valve pressure and then there's land pressure. But anyway, you're going to watch that, and you're going to see what it does. Right. And if you get used to what it, does, what it does on your transmission, it's pretty much going to act the same way on all transmissions, pretty much. I mean, the numbers may be a little bit skewed one way or another. And so if you can get used to seeing what they're supposed to look like, you're going to be a lot better able to recognize it when there's something that's not right. And that's what I'm always telling you also about scan tools. If you plug a scan tool into every good car you can possibly find and look at those numbers, and the gas it, look at it, look at it warm and all. You start looking at those numbers, you can get to where you can recognize a problem on a car that's got one. Now, if you don't hardly ever plug a scan tool in except to pull a code, you're going to be handicapped. Plug that dead gum scan tool in and start looking at them numbers. Eventually, and you're probably going to go to work at the dealership. Every time you get a chance, you know, and explain what you're doing there to somebody, if they'll let you do it, get a scan tool, get a scan tool of your own, if you got money to buy one, plug it in and look at the numbers and see what you see. You know, be surprised how many times you can find a problem, you know, that way too. Fuel trim's out of kilter or something like that. And uh, even if you're not doing the drivability work, you can say, look, the fuel trim's out of kilter on this. They're close, they're close to having a check engine light. Furthermore, if I do this oil change and I do these brakes and this check engine light comes on, even if I didn't cause it, they're going to be back in here and they're going to be fixed for free. And I think we need to tell them our fuel trim's out of balance and we need to find out what's going on. Now, the drivability guy may get you by the throat because now he's got to go hunting for something that's kind of like a ghost, you know. But the fact is... The more you look at those numbers, the better you are going to be able to. You know how treasury agents learn to recognize bogus money? Uh, Looking at real money. <laughs> I mean, they study every last little line in detail on real money until they are sick of looking at it. And they look at it some more, and they look at it some more front, back, every other kind of way. And the instant you put a bogus bill in their hands, this is bad money. They know the, bill, the feel of it, the look of it, they can tell. It may look good to me and you. But that secret service agent that's going after the counterfeiters, he can hold that thing in his hand. You know, anyway, uh, my wife is a banker, I mean a bank teller, and as soon as somebody hands her a bill that's not right, she knows it. Just as soon as they hand her one. And she looked at it, and it was 100, but when you hold it up to the light, the watermark had Lincoln's face on it. What's wrong with this picture? Who's on a $100 bill? Benjamin Franklin, she holds it up and the watermark's got Lincoln on it. Uh-oh. And she looks and the strip that's going through the bill says $5. But they've done something to change it into 100 But she knew as soon as she got it in her hand. The head teller missed it. But she caught it. You know? But anyway, that's one of the things she came back to the head teller. There ain't no way. You know? <laughs> you know, but you know how that goes. That's funny. But it's best to start pressure tests with mainline pressure. Now, you're going to find out when you look in your book where... Where you're going to tap into that. And whenever you pull that little one-eighth pipe plug out to put your pressure gauge in there, hang on to that pipe plug. Put it in your pocket. Put it in your toolbox. Put it somewhere. I say put it in your pocket. It's probably better to put it in your toolbox so you don't take it home and leave it on top of your dresser. Come back without it the next day or something. And uh, the main line pressure will be checked in each range. You know, park, reverse, you know, neutral, all those. Every range except park and neutral should be checked under three conditions. Slow idle, fast idle, and wide open throttle. Wide open throttle, you're going to check it with the brake lock, the wheels chocked, your foot will stand on the brake as hard as you can. You're going to do, you'll be doing a stall test. That's basically what you're doing on those. Uh, and uh, there should make you a form, make you a doggone form to record your readings. You can draw a form yourself. 
All you gotta do is just draw your little grid. Or if you're pretty slick and you got Microsoft Excel, you can take Microsoft Excel and, and build you a form and all that. I used to take the service pay diagnostic system when I was working at Ford Place. And it had these pressure columns for all of the different uh, gear ranges. And it had a little range that it was supposed to be in for each gear. And what, it, what we were supposed to do was we did a wide open throttle, and if it fell within this range, it would be a green line. On that, I had a transducer that I would hook to the tra to the pressure port on the transmission, and then I would and I would actually go through all my gear ranges as I was doing it. It would say, okay, and I put it in this gear. And every time I did it, it would know what gear it was in, too, because the service bay diagnostic system was hooked up to the data link under the dash, the <coughs> DCL, and the transducer was getting the pressure readings. Transducer is something, always something that gets pressure or vacuum reading. And hooks it to a computer, typically. But uh, anyway, if it was outside that range, like if it was low, it would make a red arrow right here. And it would give me something I could print out. It was really cool as all get out. I used to enjoy doing that. And uh, one time I ran into one that was out of line. And when I pulled the, the uh, pan off and I got the, uh, the little solenoid for that particular, it was energized when that gear was in, had a little piece of a shop rag thread caught in it, and it was keeping it from working. I mean, you could see that little piece of thread. You know, it's the tiniest little piece of something can make a transmission do something like that because of the importance of that hydraulic. Uh, anyway, so you ought to have, you got that, you got your hand out, don't you? All right, so make your form, record the readings. If all the pressures are within spec at slow idle, then the pump pressure regulator, uh, pump and pressure regulator function properly. Now, the pressure regulator valve, you remember what I told you that? you got a piston pushing against the spring, and the spring is calibrated, so when it pushes that piston so far, it'll bleed the pressure off. That's just a real simple definition of how a pressure regulator works. And so the pressure regulator valve on the uh, older transmissions, you know, is a totally mechanical plunger with a spring. Uh, nowadays, you know, to regulate the pressure, the uh, doggone uh, computer actually changes the pressure uh, itself, you know, with a variable force solenoid. Uh, if the pressures are low at slow idle, it makes it means a potential problem in the pump pressure regulator. Uh, you got a clogged up filter, you got low fluid or internal leakage. Let me ask you this. What if I told you that uh, I had checked the transmission fluid? Now, you know when you check it cold, it's going to be lower on the stick and when you check it hot. Right. A lot of them have two ranges. Okay, I've checked my fluid. It's warm. It's hot. The stick is showing it's full. And I head off down the street and I turn the corner. And when I turn the corner, it seems to drop into neutral. Oh. And it goes... What are you going to tell me? It's got to be a little fluid. Even though it's feeling, even though it reads full, some yo-yo has stuck the wrong dipstick in there. Oh, it right. has to be low on fluid. If you make a corner and it neutralizes and then it catches again, it's sloshing fluid away from the pickup. So, you know, add another quart of fluid to it and just see how it does then. If it does right then, you better put the right dipstick in it. Because, you know, you know how dipsticks get lost and mixed yeah. up and mm -hmm. somebody grabbed the one that went on the other truck and all that kind of stuff. That's just a little, you know, I don't charge enough for that. That's the same thing. So, uh, all right. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, if the pressures are now, uh, you know, let's see, verify where the problem is. Check them at fast idle. If it reads uh, normal then, it usually means the pump wore out, but the problem could still be internal leaks. See what I mean? If the pump is not putting out enough, you get that problem. But if you've got leaks inside, you remember how on your engine oil pressure, if you've got worn out bearings, the oil pressure is trying to show that oil up in there, and it wants it not to have a whole lot of space to squirt out somewhere. See, if I had a anything, in any sort of a hydraulic system like that, if I've got a bearing that fits pretty tight, and I'm running a, a two, I mean, a drilling. All right, so let's go, let's go back to where we were. Internal leaks is going to show up in a particular range. A forward clutch leak could have a normal pressure in park, reverse and neutral, but have low pressure in all forward ranges. So when you put, when that forward clutch is supposed to be applied, oh, and the valve's not there. Mm, okay, so it's shooting juice over here. Uh, did you ever check the pressure on the transmission? Mm. All right, so. Pull it out before that oh, well, oh, sorry, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeremy had actually checked the pressure on that thing when he moved the face. The well, odd thing about it was he really didn't see anything wrong with the pressure when he had a gauge on it. Isn't that interesting? But, but anyway, if the pressure's. Uh, if you got an internal leak, let's say you put you're going to put it down in you put it down in a gear, any gear like let's say the pressure is always low in any forward gear, and you look and you you look at your chart. There's charts that you can see that tells you which 
clutches are applied in which gear. And there are charts that will do that. And so you look at those charts and you say, which clutch is applied in which gear? And so uh, if, you, if it's low consistently, any time that clutch is applied, then when you tear the transmission down, you're going to know that that forward clutch is the one you need to be looking at. I think that's what's wrong with that transmission down there. And you're going to look at the, the fluid passages. You're going to look at the, the, in the valve body, what, everything it feeds at. If i got a stuck valve that's supposed to be moving and blocking the pressure, that's, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And that's how you isolate what's going on there. But you've got to get familiar with the transmission you're working on. If you're really familiar with it already because you've done a lot of them, that's great, you know, because you can do it a lot quicker that way. Uh, a direct clutch leak will show a pressure drop when the transmission shifts to third and low pressure uh, in reverse because in most cases, direct clutch is on in third and reverse. See, if you look at if you know which clutches are applied and you know which solenoids are on and off and all that, that's when you're going to be able to zero in on what the problem is and do some real troubleshooting when you're working transmit. A restricted filter is going to show up as a gradual pressure drop at higher engine RPM because the filter can't pass as much fluid as the pump's trying to draw. pump's trying to suck fluid. It's like a fuel filter, right? It keeps trying to pull that fluid, and it's gonna, you're going to see the pressure fall off, and you say, well, my filter's clogged. One of the things we used to do is the old Chrysler uh, torque flight transmissions when I was working at a gas station in the 70s. We'd get some stuff called TransClean. It's still out there, but I don't know if it's even the same stuff. It used to be made by Silu. And uh, we would uh, have a transmission like a Dodge. It just wouldn't even already pull. We'd, pull, we'd change the fluid and filter, which it had a real a sort of a fine cloth looking through and fill. Pop that sucker back on there with the three little screws, you know, and put the, put a pan back on there and we fill it up with fluid. But we displace half a quarter of that fluid with some of that transclean. And we get that thing good and hot and we drive it around, drive it around, drive it around, drive it around. And that transclean would wash everything down real good inside that transmission. And when we pull the filter back off, it'd be stopped up again. Because <laughs> all the stuff that it washed out of there, the varnish that it washed off the oh. valves and the valve body and all that nonsense. When the fluid gets hot, it gets sticky and it starts to plant varnish everywhere. That's the way automatic transmissions do. Somebody's been pulling a heavy trailer, then they're going to have sticky, ugly fluid. You know, if you pull the tri- dipstick out of one and it's got sticky, ugly, dark fluid, it usually means they've been pulling something real heavy. Because if it shares that fluid, it begins to change the qualities of that fluid, you see. And all that. Uh, struck pressure regulator valve is going to show up as a fixed line pressure. You can get these answers out of your out of this thing I'm saying here, and you got the same handout. You better hold on to this handout. This handout is invaluable in the field. You probably should laminate this handout and keep it with you, right? Okay, the pressure may vary with engine RPM. It means low pressure at slow RPM and high pressure at higher RPM, but there will be no boost in pressure from the throttle valve or modulator system and no reverse boost. Now, why are we talking about the throttle valve and the modulator system? What are the throttle valve and the modulator system for? Why do we have a throttle valve? Why do we have a modulator? We won't usually have both. It's going to hold the shift longer when you're deeper into it. The modulator is getting vacuum from the engine. High engine load means low vacuum. Low vacuum means it's going to hold the gears longer because it lets that valve. You know, it's actually, remember the governor pressure and modulator pressure are fighting each other? That's what I told you before. Okay, throttle valve pressure does the same thing. The deeper into the throttle you are, and Chrysler has never used a modulator valve. I had a 67 Chrysler New Yorker, and it did not have a modulator valve. But it did have an upside-down speedometer. You know, and it did have a 440, and boy, would it ever go. All right. Um, but the front windows on that car, the front windows on that car were the only ones that worked. The back ones didn't work. And so one day, me and Steve and Danny and uh, Bill Dozier were riding around in that car. And it was January, and it was cold. It was a Sunday afternoon. And Danny wanted to go. He had just got in the National Guard. So he wanted to go out there to the PX and buy this little sharpening rock kit. Buck, you know, he had the two rocks and a little rock and a big rock, and he had a can of honing hon- hon- oil. Well, you know, you screw the lid off that honing oil, there's a little top that you got to cut off before the oil will come out. You know what I'm talking about? And so he's in the back seat. Steve's in the front. And Steve says, uh, here, let me use your knife to cut the top out of this can because I don't have my knife and i got to spit. Because he kept rolling my window down, spitting tobacco juice out the <laughs> window, you know. And I said, quit rolling my window down because he can burn it up. You know, he can roll it down, roll it up. Well, he says, well, I don't have a can, so I don't have my knife to cut the top out of one. So I give him a soda pop can. He cuts the top out and he's spitting in it. And so Danny said in the back, his windows don't work. And Danny says, let me borrow your can. He said, you ain't borrowing my can. So get your ear. Danny's starting to get full. He's got to open the door a bit, see? <laughs> so Danny says, cut the top out of my can. I said, you got your knife. I'm not going to cut the top of your can. You're going to mess up my knife. So Danny says, uh, kept, he threw me, you know, kept throwing the can back up there, and I wouldn't ever cut the top out of the can. He kept asking for Steve, and Steve wouldn't loan him his can. And so 
Danny took this little flat thing that he had bit off the top of the honing oil can and he thumped it on Steve's arm. Now this is this is funny, so keep listening. He thumps <laughs> it on Steve's arm and it goes onto his shirt sleeve. And Steve, Steve thought it was something he got out of his nose. <laughs> so Steve thumped it off and took a little bit of, of a tobacco stem, threw it back there on him. Danny was wearing a suede jacket. <laughs> You're off of there. All right, now think about how stupid this is. Now, Tyler would never do this. So Steve's sitting in there, and Danny takes his honing oil can, and he squirts honing oil in Steve's ear. Oh, man. Steve's holding a can of tobacco spit. Oh. <laughs> so the tobacco spit goes on the suede jacket. Boosh. <laughs> this is getting ugly. <laughs> <laughs> and then if that wasn't enough, I'm glad he already threw this a bag of spit because he was sitting here and he had the window down about this much and he'd have his elbow up here and he had his hands up just outside the window. Well, I wasn't going to do anything about that, but he took his hand down to get his can. And about the time he took his hand down, I looked over and I said, I don't know why he's got that window down because it's cold out there. And I went to roll it up. When I looked over here to find the switch, he put his hand back in there. <laughs> he rolled it up. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> He gets his finger, so he rolled it back down, and he took my baseball cap off on my head and threw it out the window, you know, and I'm driving down the road 60 miles an hour. Golly, this was a disaster. Everybody's retaliating, you know, and it snowballed out of control. I don't know how I got off on that, but uh, I bored Tyler to tears because he just kept working. No, I've heard it before. All right, yep. But anyway, that was a funny, uh, that was a funny, funny afternoon, and uh, we were about your age when all that stuff went on. But anyway, um. If the pressures are high at slow idle, it indicates a pressure regulator or a throttle pressure problem. On most cars, the modulator controls throttle pressure, right? If the transmission has a throttle pressure tap, and not all of them do, it'll let you. It'll tell you if the transmission throttle pressure circuit is a problem. Now, on the Forge, on the Crown Vickies and stuff that had AODs in them, we used to actually set the throttle valve pressure. It had to be set just right so that it would, you know, shift shift probably be like it's supposed to be. On GM units without a throttle pressure tap, you got to remove the throttle valve plunger. If the line pressure is normal, it's a throttle valve problem. If it's not a pressure regulator problem. If not, it's a pressure regulator problem. So you can see how this is leading you to where you need to go. See, uh, pressures need to be checked at stall or wide open throttle. Uh, when you're doing a stall test, observe safety precautions. You don't want the thing jumping off of the, you know, over your chocks and all, and running over somebody's toolbox and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you ought to uh, be in under operating conditions, you know. You want to make sure that the fluid's nice and warm and all that. Uh, to do a stall test, put the selector in a range to be tested one foot on the brake. Uh, you know, you're going to lock the brake, chalk the, I mean, everything you can. I'm going to tell you something, guys. Sometimes you cannot hold that brake enough to do a stall test without spinning the wheel. You just can't do it. I mean, if, if it starts spinning the wheels, you ain't doing a stall test. You're just burning rubber. So you don't, it ain't a good idea to do that. I'm going to be honest with you. It's, I would rather do the stall test in the parking lot than in the shop. Because yes, of the noise. And also because usually the parking lot has, has got bumpier pavement and it's less likely to spin the wheels than it is on a smooth concrete. That's just my personal preference. And I ain't do it for guilty. Um, on those power stroke diesels, we used to have to. And this is crazy, but on the power stroke diesels, when we were checking to see if the uh, checking to see if the uh, friction, I mean, if the uh, anti foaming additives had broke down in the oil, we would. Uh, what the book says. Now this is not in gear. This is just uh, we would hold the throttle to the floor and hold it wide open throttle for three minutes. Now think about what I just said. Wide open throttle for three minutes. The guy in the next stall over here is not going to be able to even hear his iPod, right? So the best thing you can do is get that. Everybody else in the shop's going to be mad at you because this thing, you know, if you've ever heard a power stroke diesel at wide open throttle for three minutes, you'll know that everybody's going to have it ringing in their ears. When, well, go out in the parking lot, leave the building like Elvis, and get out there and just let it have it out there if you're going to do that. But, I mean, that's the only, only time you're ever supposed to do anything, I guess, when the book calls for it. What happens if you try to wide open throttle a car, I mean, something like your truck or one of the other cars? Ah! It shuts off the injector. Mom, 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 mom. It won't stay at wide open throttle. All that diesel will go, ah, which is only 3,500 RPM anyway, but it's loud and it'll get out. Some technicians will pull the vacuum line off of the modulator valve or pull the TV cable with engine at fast idle, and that's not operating conditions. It will not detect a problem of trapped vacuum or a cable problem. See, if your cable is not acting like it's supposed to, then that's a, that can be a problem, too, that can make it not shield good. Uh, if all pressures at stall are low, then you ought to pull the TV cable to the maximum or disconnect the vacuum line. And if they're okay, then the problem's in the cable or the vacuum system. If the pressures are still low, then the problem's in the pump or control system. Got that? 
Everybody understand what you're looking at there. See how good this handout is? This is one of the best things that I've seen in a long time. If the pressures at the stall are high, then you've got to look at the idle pressures. If the idle pressures are high, that could be a pressure regulator or a throttle system problem. See how simple and direct this is? It's very simple, very direct. If idle pressures are normal, uh, the problem is just the throttle system. So the reverse stall test is also a maximum pump output test. If you suspect a weak pump, then that test will help you find it. See where I'm going? You going to hang on to this handout? You're going to laminate it and put it in your hook box? I mean, it's really good. It's going to show us low pressure, reverse stall, but all the other pressures, including that, will be normal. The fun part of doing any kind of transmission repair is doing every test you can before you ever tear into it to find out what's wrong. You want to gather all the information you can. Anytime you're going to do anything, it's best to gather a lot of information. I get a lot of emails from people that says, let me hit you with this one here. This guy says, I had, uh, I've got this little uh, Dodge Neon, and I've got uh, low com compression, like zero compression on one of the cylinders, and blah, 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 blah. And then I found out the head gasket was blown between cylinders three and four. You know, he had pretty decent compression on three of the cylinders and zero on the other. So he changed the head, pop pull the head, the head off, you know, I guess he valve jobbed it and all that. And he put the, uh, put it on there with a new head gasket, and he had 60 pounds of compression on all the cylinders. After he did that, he put oil in the cylinder. And he still had like 60 pounds That's on every cylinder. Now, of course, it's a dual overhead cam, and he had to pull the head off, and, of course, he had time and belt and all that kind of stuff. Did he put it in the timer? Well, he claims he did. He says, is it possible it could be a tooth off? I said, well, you need to check it. If you've got 60 pounds on every cylinder, and you didn't have any, you know, you and you put you oil put in there, and it didn't come up. <coughs> See? See what I'm saying? I mean, that's the whole thing. Now, some people will just fly in there and start doing work. And then they'll find out that they've done a bunch of stuff that didn't need to be done because they didn't actually find out what was going on before they went in there. That's what this is about. You're trying to find out as much as you can. You, every piece of information you gather, nothing may be conclusive in and of itself, but every piece of, or it might, but every piece, piece of information you gather is going to be something you can think about when you tear the transmission down. One of the scariest things in the world is to have a transmission that ain't working right. And you go in there, and you go all the way through it, and you don't find a daggum thing wrong with it. There's no cracked piston, there's no wear out bushings, there's no hard seals, there's no burned up clutches. Now what are you going to do? You're going to put it back together and hope to Betsy that you didn't miss something like a hairline crack somewhere. You know, you ain't got no stuck valves, you ain't got no broke springs, but it ain't working right. Put it back together. And then you find out the daggum throttle valve cable was stuck. And you could have put a throttle valve cable on. You've done all this work. And now you're going to feel like crap, especially if you charge the customer for a rebuild, $2,500, when you could have replaced the throttle valve cable. You might even be able to get away with that and say, by the way, why well, don't we put a throttle valve cable on that? Like, you sure, or you just add that to the bill. But in your mind, if you've got any kind of a conscience, you rebuilt the darn thing when it didn't need it. You see what I'm saying? That's why it's a good idea to find out everything you can all the data you can gather so you can piece it together and make doggone sure that you eliminate stuff. That's the way that, that me and Donnie, when we're working on something, that's what we think. Sometimes when Donnie's out of ideas, he calls me up. When I'm out of ideas, I call Donnie up. Two heads are better than one. I don't care how smart you think you are. You can always get good ideas from somebody else that's on your level. And Donnie called the other day, and he said, I got a Chevrolet that idles like crap. It's been all over the place. And he said it'll stall. But if I unplug the bypass wire going to the distributor, like I was going to set the time, and it won't ever stall. It'll sit there and run just fine. So he said, it was like a 91 Chevy. And he says, what do I do with that? I said, well, it sounds to me like you got something going on with that distributor. He said, well, they already put a new distributor on it. The thing's been at every shop in the country for six months. Nobody's been able to fix this darn thing. And I said, well, let me go to Identifix. So I pulled Identifix up, and it said, if you pull the, the bypass wire and it doesn't stall, then spin it over and check the, pick the output of your pickup coil. If it's not at least 700 millivolts, then you got a bad pickup coil. Or your distributor shaft is wiggling or something. So, so Donnie says, hmm, that's something I can sink my teeth into there. I can go ahead and get them numbers. So he called me back and he says, I checked the distributor in the truck, spinning it over. It's got 300 millivolts. I got a distributor out of the box that I got from the parts house and hooked up to it and checked it. And I spun it with my fingers. I got three volts. Put it in there, run like a sewing machine. It hadn't skipped anymore. Been at shop after shop after shop after shop for six months and nobody been able to fix it. You see what I'm saying? Well, what I did was I didn't have I wasn't the fountain of all knowledge, but I had a resource that he didn't have. I looked it up on Identifix, 
found it. Some other mechanic was smarter than me. He knew exactly where to go because he'd seen this problem before. Do you know what I'm saying? That's why Identifix is just about something you can't get by without. You get used to it here, you're going to want it out there. That's why they give it to me free because they know you guys are going to get addicted to it. <laughs> and when you go to work somewhere, you're going to start saying, man, we need Identifix, we need Identifix. You see? All right. So, remember this now. <laughs> remember that you reverse. What, what have you noticed? The ones of you guys that have done pressure tests, what have you noticed about reverse? The pressure's in reverse. What makes what's different from, about them? Yeah, zero. Huh? Zero. No. No, that was modulated. That was oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Now what I'm talking about is the pressures in reverse are just about always higher than in every other gear. On every transmission I remember checking, it's always a higher pressure. The pressure it's supposed to be is higher, and it typically be a higher pressure. That's why I'm saying a reverse stall test is a maximum pump output test. And so if you suspect a weak pump, then that test will help find it. It didn't say that it'll definitely pinpoint it, but it will help find it. You see what their words are here? Okay, if a pervert wants to become really proficient with the pressure gauge, you put it on their own vehicle and leave it there for a week. Drive it around. Watch the numbers, man. That's what you're going to do there. Every time you drive the car, you ought to watch the gauge. Of course, my dad told me one time, I had this, my friend had this 65 Galaxy, I mean 65 uh, SS uh, in, you know, Impala, the yellow one. And over on the right hand side of that long parcel on the dash, there was a vacuum gauge or and it was always doing this whenever he was driving. I don't know what that was for. I mean, heck, I went about 12, 13. I drive in, he's like 17. And I asked my dad one day, my dad had a shop and fixed cars and all that, and I said, What is a vacuum gauge for on a car? And he said, That's something you look at while you're having a wreck. You spend too much time watching the gauge go run into something else. Like it was. Okay, one week, after a week, you ought to put the gauge on every single car in the shop that not, does not have a problem. Every time you can. What I tell you about a Secret Service guy, right? Now you look at the real money. You look at the real scan tool readings. You look at the real pressure. If you really want to get good at this, after 30 days of using a gauge on units that work properly, you can start using a gauge on units with problems. All right, the, the technician, and look at your question down there. The technician is accustomed to normal readings. Abnormal readings will stand out like a sore thumb. All right? Everybody is supposed to be proficient in the use of a pressure gauge. Okay, now, right down here, we got some math. Don't you just love this? Okay, to figure the area of a circle, which would be a valve or a servo, uh, the radius, which is half the diameter, times radius, times 3.14159, equals the area. So a one-inch diameter circle has a radius of a half an inch. And that's one of your questions down there, by the way. Uh, see, uh, see all them things on the back of that page? Uh, yeah, you're a good, you're a math whiz, right? Yeah. Well, you used to be. What happened? Did you get dumbed down after you left school? You used to, get, you used to know the math answer is pretty strong. Whenever I would ask them more. All right, you got that? Did y'all catch how fast Gene answered that? Mm -hmm. That question I asked the other day, and I hadn't asked him that before. And he don't even mechanic, but he put all that stuff together with lightning speed. You know, you need to learn to think like that. You understand what I'm saying? Rewire your brain so that you can think quick whenever you got to do something like that. The shop foreman over at the Ford place used to come and get me to, he'd have these shims that would have metric thickness readings and he'd want me to convert it to standard thousands where he could understand what he was saying. <laughs> and so I'd have to do it with pencil and paper or something. And you can figure it out think about it. Okay, one eight, a one inch diameter circle has an area of what? An area. What's the area of a one-inch diameter circle? Huh? 0.785 square inches. One inch square. Pressure times area equal force. Right? So if you got 100 PSI of line pressure on a servo with an area of two square inches, uh, there you go. You got that? Everybody got that, right? Force divided by area equals pressure. If you got 200 pounds divided by two, you got 100 PSI. Force divided by pressure equal area. Have you guys got a deer in the head last glazed over eyeballs now? Are you looking up, up in the air with your mouth open? This stuff right here is really, really good stuff. You know where I got this particular uh, part right here? It's this thing I'm, I'm giving you with these numbers on it. All data. Came out of all data. Ain't that something? I'm going to tell you, there's good stuff in there. If you'll just dig and look and read. Uh, and all that, you know, I think it's not worth your time. You ought to be able to answer this. Okay, now let's look at this right here. Everybody got this? Uh, Tyler's been answering some questions. The throttle pressure test is also a maximum pump output test. True or false? Mm -hmm. 
the reverse stall test is the maximum pump output test, right? Okay, when doing a stall test, always observe safety precautions such as checking for broke motor mounts or bad brakes and that kind of thing. Now, why is a broke motor mount a problem? The engine try to jump out of the car, won't it? Yeah, mine was doing it one time. I thought I had a hot ride. My car was jumping off the ground. Yeah. That's what I wanted. Motor mount was broke. See, Lawrence has been around uh, and worked with a lot of well, rough cars for a long time. All right. Uh, each range except drive and reverse should be checked under three conditions slow idle, fast idle, and wide open throttle. True. That's false. false. It's spark and neutral. Uh oh. Yes. oh. Spark and neutral. There you go. You remember that. After 30 days of using a gauge on units that don't work properly, start using a gauge on units that do not have problems. Okay. After 30 days of using them work properly, then you're going to use them on units with problems. So it ought to be helped if you're in custom normal reading. Right? A diameter of a circle. A one-inch diameter circle has a radius of a half inch. That's true. That's true. A stuck pressure regulator valve will show up as what kind of line pressure? Fixed. Fixed line pressure. Seven, testing should always be done under what conditions? Operating. Operating conditions, yeah. Don't change a lot of stuff and expect to get good numbers if you've unplugged the vacuum line or if you pull the car and all that. What's the reason most people don't use a pressure gauge? Huh? Right, it's, like it's the first paragraph. Test. The very first paragraph. The very the most the reason most of them don't use it. They don't t it doesn't tell them how to fix a problem. And they don't see the value in using one. Either one of those will work for you. Okay, number nine. Pressures need to be checked at stall, which is actually wow. wide open throttle. Now you don't check it at wide open throttle in park or neutral. Okay? You're only gonna do that when you're in gear, and it's really important to make sure you do that safely. Because I'm telling you guys. You have got a tremendous amount of power harnessed there. All right, you got that? Okay, it usually, let's see, number 10, to verify where the problem is, check pressures at fast idle if the pressures now read normally. In other words, if they were low, I didn't even write, I didn't type that question right. If they were low at idle, check them at fast idle, which is a little, you know, like 1,200, 1,500 RPM. Now, like Brandon did the other day when I was doing the transmission uh, thing, I said, okay, Brandon, find me uh, 1,500 RPM. And Brandon was going, oh, 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 Brandon, hello, where's 1,500 RPM? He got, well, try 2,000 and all that. He was having the he hardest, time, phone. hardest time with that. Well, his phone helped him with that the other day, too, so he found him. He was texting while he was sitting in the car operating the gas, I guess. So, uh, so you're going to check the pressures at fast idle if they're normally, normally at fast idle but low at idle. What does that mean? Indicates a worn pump. A worn pump. And worn, you know, worn pumps are more common than you know. Uh, in number 11, uh, 100 PSI line pressure times 2 square inches equals how many pounds of force? Duh. Okay, number 12. What's the formula and answer for this problem? Uh, 7.5 pounds times 9.5 equals 71.25. I just wanted to make sure you read the handout. Okay. So basically, we all went through it together. Is that a good handout? Was that a good lesson? All right, then. So now uh, it's time to go to the shop and spend the rest of the day out there. Oh, and I know you, all right, you guys got to work hard. <laughs>